Right. Hello all, good afternoon. I'm Wendell Long, Subject Head Economics, Yuri Roitek. Welcome to today's webinar entitled, Revolutionizing Education in the Caribbean. I would like to open today's conference with a prayer. Dear God, we come to you asking for your blessings as we are gathered here today. We pray for your guidance in matters at hand and ask that you would clearly show us how to conduct our work with a spirit of joy and enthusiasm. We pray for mercy and grace in light of the pandemic. Help us to work together and encourage each other to excellence. Amen. Director of Academic Services, Dr. Brunton, Head Department of Economics, Dr. Conrad, members of faculty, teachers, students, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to our first annual webinar hosted by Quote, Youth of the Department of Economics and Uri Roy Tech Economic Subject Group. Today's topic is revolutionizing education in the Caribbean. As we approach 90 years since Schumpeter posited that innovation led to the creative, creative destruction and fuel for the capitalist world order. Indeed, it can be said that innovation is already happening in today's education system occasioned by COVID-19. And we await our entitled panelists to carry us through this revolutionary journey. At this point, I would like to introduce Dr. Brunton, Director of Academic Services, Yuri Roitek, to give greetings from the institution. Dr. Brunton. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Fortunately, Ms. Wendy Augustus, our beloved Executive Director, of Yuri Roitek is unable to bring greetings in person today. Ms. Augustus did, however, express her excitement and support for this inaugural event that expects that this webinar series dedicated to issues of the economy and geared towards youth is destined for success. On behalf of Yuri Roitek, I wish to extend a warm welcome to all of you who are able to join us live at this event today. Your interest and support today means a lot, especially given the current challenges and uncertainty that we face at what I hope is the peak of the pandemic for Trinidad and Tobago. My name is Ronald Brunton. I'm the Director of Academic Services at UV Roy Tech. Again, I wish to welcome you all today and to expend, extend a special welcome to all members of the management administrators, department heads, and faculty of the, UV, of the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, and of course, UV Roy Tech. I extend a warm welcome to all students and young persons from both institutions, as well as students and youth from other institutions who made it to today's inaugural annual webinar series. Welcome to all stakeholders, specially invited guests, and members of the public who have an interest in discussions about the economy and the future of higher education. UV Roy Tech is especially pleased to be involved in this auspicious event. Uh, indeed, this is really a special event um, in this planning as uh, Mr. Wendell Long, our chair today, had initially engaged me with this idea back in January, uh, hoping that he would get support from UV Roy Tech. Of course, Ms. Augustus and myself immediately uh, acknowledge support and through our support behind Mr. Wendell Long's planning for this event. Through our conversations about today's theme, revolutionizing education in the Caribbean, Mr. Long invited me to participate in the event and as such, you will see me a bit later again today as one of the panelists in the armchair discussion. As many of you already knew, know, the success of UV Roy Tech has been due in large part to its many and strong partnerships with institutions such as the University of New Brunswick, Franklin University, the Commonwealth of Learning, Monroe University area, and of course the UE, the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, among many other institutions. I am thus very pleased to strengthen this partnership between UE Roitek and the youth of the Department of Economics. Through events such as today's conference on the economy, we not only strengthen our partnership, we also have a unique opportunity 
to raise the caliber of the discourse on some of the most relevant issues impacting our society and our economy. We have an opportunity today to discuss and debate how our education system needs to respond, to adapt, to transform, how we prepare young people to take up their roles and lead positive change. And of course, in doing so, we start with the assumption that there is a need for change in the education system of the Caribbean, in Trinidad and Tobago, and globally. We also acknowledge that change needs to be revolutionary in that slow and incremental change will not always be enough to keep pace with the global and technological changes impacting on the workplace and the economy. Of course, this is the most opportune time for this conversation as we are witnessing unprecedented change in the education system due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The sudden shift from face-to-face -to, -face to online learning has impacted all levels of the education system, from early childhood education through primary and secondary to higher education. Indeed, even at the preschool level, children are being taught online, using of Teams, WhatsApp, Moodle, and many other platforms to reach learners while we survive the pandemic staying at home. Students are engaged through the virtual classroom, they take online quizzes, participate in online educational games and produce multimedia presentations. Some students may even be enrolled in universities in other countries or enrolled in MOOCs from prestigious universities such as Harvard, Oxford or MIT. The traditional brick and mortar face-to-face -face education that was mainstream just over a year ago now seems obsolete in the new normal catalyzed by the COVID-19 pandemic and the fourth industrial revolution. As a student of the social sciences and of education, and having been exposed to thinkers such as Karl Marx, Lloyd Bess, CLR James, Carl Jung, Paolo Freire, John Dewey, and many others, the concepts of revolution, revolutionary, and revolutionizing are of course extremely interesting and stimulating. Applying their ideas to education an even more interesting conversation. Now, the concept of revolution among political scientists speaks to fundamental and relatively sudden change in political power and political organization, which usually occurs when the population revolts against the government, typically due to perceived oppression. History has recorded revolutions such as the American Revolution and the French Revolution that heralded the dawn of modern democracies. The Russian Revolution, Chinese Revolution, and of course the Cuban Revolution also saw the establishment of entrenched communist systems in these countries as well. The Industrial Revolution was based on the transition to new manufacturing processes in Europe and the United States, including going from hand production methods to machine production, new chemical manufacturing and iron production processes, the development of machine tools and the rise of mechanized factory systems. The fourth industrial revolution or industry 4.0 is based on the automation of traditional manufacturing and industrial practices using modern smart technologies large-scale machine-to-machine communication, the internet of things, and production of smart machines that can analyze and diagnose issues with a limited human intervention. From a business and management perspective, the term revolutionize generally means to completely change something, a production process, a business process, a service, so that it is much better. In terms of efficiency, effectiveness or quality. The result is generally measured in time, number of in units produced, and ultimately customer satisfaction, profit and mar market share. Whatever your perspective, revolution and revolutionizing involves disruptive change that often has unforeseen and unintended implications. I hope that today's discussion will allow us to touch on some of the ways in which our education system uh, will be revolutionized 
due to the current COVID pandemic and the underlying inequalities in the education system that needs to be urgently addressed. How can our education system be dramatically improved to be more efficient, more effective, more relevant, and more responsive to the changing workplace? But also, how will the education system be revolutionized to be more equitable, more just, and more responsive to the needs of the most underserved students? I hope that this conversation today will allow us the views and perspectives of the youth to be heard and to serve as a transformative event. Thank you all very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank, thank you, Dr. Brunton. Now I would like um, to invite um, Dr. St. Martin on behalf of Dr. Conrad, who is having a bit of technical issues, to give greetings on behalf of Court and the Department of Economics, UE. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. On behalf of the head of the Department of Economics, Dr. Darren Conrad, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome everyone here and to thank our panelists for being part of this discussion. As coordinator of the Court Youth Events, the committee and I are passionate about engaging in discussions of this nature which provides an opportunity for us to explore authentic youth engagement. Utilizing meaningful youth participation can contribute to adequately addressing issues that affect youth and, and have more structured programs and policies. With the coronavirus pandemic, we have been faced with an unprecedented crisis in, a lot, in all areas. However, we still believe that in keeping with the saying, crisis is opportunity, it provides us an opportunity to capitalize and innovate and, and advance our development agenda. So as we embark on this first webinar collaboration with UE Roy Tech, it is our hope that you enjoy and actively participate through the discussions in today's events and we look forward to your continued support and participation. Thank you. Right, thank you, uh, Roxanne. Um, please allow me now to introduce the moderator of the armchair discussion, wearing two hats today, Dr. Roxanne Brizan St. Martin. Uh, Dr. St. Martin is an economist attached to the Department of Economics the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. Her area of focus lies in health and developmental economics. She is also the coordinator of the Conference of, U of the Economy Youth Events of the Department of Economics. I will now hand you over to the capable hands and highly experienced and exciting Dr. Roxanne Brizan St. Martin. Over to you. All right, thank you, Chair. And again, welcome to our panelists and the general audience to our webinar collaboration between UE Roy Tech and the Court Youth of the Department of Economics. Again, just to highlight, the theme for this webinar is revolutionizing education in the Caribbean. As I said uh, a while ago, you know, with the coronavirus, we have been faced with a, a pandemic, a crisis that is unprecedented in so many areas. But again, discussions of this nature allows us to, to explore opportunities where we can innovate and capitalize in order to, to change things and change the way we've been doing things. Today, we have a dynamic panel with, which will be giving us perspectives on a range of issues relating to education in the Caribbean and the need to adapt and change as we navigate in this new normal. So I would now introduce our panelists. Our panelists today are Ms. Maya Joseph. Maya is an undergraduate student at the University of the West Indies pursuing a bachelor's in economics, accompanied by a, a minor in finance. She intends on making an impactful contribution to Trinidad and Tobago, and to a greater extent the region through her love for economics. Additionally, Maya is enthusiastic about self-evaluation and entrepreneurship. Apart from um, academics, she enjoys baking, 
and intends to establish her own business. Our second presenter today is Ms. Adana Stout. Adana is an undergraduate at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine, pursuing a bachelor's in political science along with a minor in psychology and international relations. She's ambitious and passionate and intends to use these qualities, as she says, to turn the wheels of the world. Our third speaker today, Mr. Yamir Fletcher, is a second year management student of UWE Roy Tech from the Tunapuna area in Trinidad. He is dedicated to personal and spiritual growth and helping others in any way he can. He strives to gain knowledge and apply it to persistence and reliance on God. He loves physical training and basketball. Our fourth panelist today, Mr. Pradeep Mathura, is a teacher at the Swaha Hindu College, where he delivers the, the economics curriculum, both at the CSEC and CAPE level. Pradeep enjoys teaching and sharing his knowledge with students. He has worked with the Caribbean Examination Council as a marker both for CSEC and the CAPE examinations. He holds a Master of Education in Curriculum and has tutored the Foundations in Education course for the Teacher Diploma in Education program at the School of Education, UWE St. Augustine. Our final presenter and no stranger, Dr. Ronald Brunton is a Caribbean tertiary level educator, researcher, and higher education administrator. His research interests include higher education policy, educational indicators, curriculum, distance, and an alternative education delivery systems, quality assurance, and the role of education in national development. He is the director of the academic services at the UWE School of Business and Applied Studies, UWE Roy Tech, a business college in Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Brunton is a former director of qualifications and recognition at the Accreditation Council of Trinidad and Tobago and served as president of the Caribbean Area Network for Quality Assurance in Tertiary Education. Each speaker, and that's it for our panelists, each speaker will have 10 minutes to present, following which we will engage in a brief discussion between myself and the presenters. You, the viewing audience, will then be allowed to pose questions via the chat feature. Please ensure you indicate which presenter your question or comment is being directed to. I take this opportunity to welcome all our panelists, and we will now go to our first speaker, Ms. Maya Joseph, who will present on the critical links between mental health and education. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. When it comes to mental health, education is an important factor. Improvements in the educational system in the Caribbean stems back to the emancipation in 1838, where there was an increase in elementary schools and secondary schools throughout the region. Many times I would hear persons speak about how their great grandparents or grandparents only completed school at the primary school level and it left me baffled. This is because in those days, children stayed in primary school until the age of 16 or 17, and secondary school was only an option if one was able to afford it or had gotten a scholarship if they had passed the college, the college exhibition exam. It wasn't until 1961 the Secondary Entrance Assessment, or SEA, was introduced across the Caribbean countries. The age for exiting primary school was now reduced to 11 or 12, and paying and paying to attend a secondary school was no longer mandatory, but a mere option to some parents as there were both government and private schools available. Now, as this may have been seen as an act of progression in the education system, it has caused tremendous effects on students' mental health. Mental health, according to the World Health Organization, is a state of well-being in which every individual realizes their own potential can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, 
and is able to contribute to their community. In preparation for SE, students endure a lot of pressure which depletes their mental health. There are both societal and in-house factors that can cause this. In the Caribbean, we have the habit of classifying whether or not schools are prestigious. With that being said, students are pressured by teachers or parents to ensure that they pass for what is known as a good school. This can lead to pushing children beyond their academic limits, ensuring the entrance grade is met. This can cause depression, anxiety, traumas, and the list continues. It has been reported to lead to students committing self-harm, mutilation, and attempted suicides. Moving along, due to the appalling effects of the pandemic, education was challenged to accept a new normal, which meant that it would be taught virtually where students and teachers can abide by the prevention methods that were established. This, ha this has both positive and negative effects on not only students, but also teachers and parents. Being educated online allows individuals who are comfortable in their own space the opportunity to flourish and work at a moderate pace suitable for them. This is, there is more relaxation time and an opportunity to correct poor sleeping habits. Being online also boosts confidence in persons who are shy or have a disability. In addition, being online and home may increase parent involvement, which can be beneficial to children who feel neglected. Since there is no physical school, there is an ease in finances where transportation and school supplies such as new uniforms, shoes, bags, and lunch kits are no longer a necessity, which I'm sure parents can appreciate. Additionally, teachers experience a reduction in financial demands of school. There is no need to purchase new work clothes and supplies such as whiteboard markers. These factors can decrease tiredness, anxiety, and depression, which can lead to increased productivity in all parties involved. On the flip side, online learning can do harm to one's mental health. Some students may feel isolated and depressed due to no face-to-face -face interaction with peers. Also, coping mechanisms such as activities at school or sports can no longer take place. Last year, a student who was 14 years of age committed suicide. The family mentioned that not being able to partake in activities did not help, meaning this could have been a coping mechanism for the student. There is also the mental stress that parents are unable to properly assist their children with schoolwork, especially if their child has a disability. Teachers as well, who are also parents, may find it challenging to complete their job at home as well as ensuring their child's academic and mental interests are prioritized. Additionally, the increased demand for tablets and computers can impose a burden on parents and with the increased levels of retrenchment and decreasing incomes, it worsens the situation. There is also the issue of parents being unable to operate technology. The stress in the household can affect both parents and child. Mental health is increasing among students and therefore should not be overlooked. Just as mental health can affect education and performance levels, education can also affect mental health. Symptoms of mental illness in children should not be overseen by parents or teachers. Children should not be deemed a bad child or lazy if they are showing signs of being depressed or constantly tired, etc. In recent times, there has been an increase in the awareness of mental health as society has recognized the importance and cruciality of it. With May being the month of mental health awareness, quotes, motivational videos, webinars, and so forth flooded social media with the aim of encouraging persons of all age groups to take care of their mental health as well as supporting others on their journey. This can educate parents, students, and teachers on signs to observe as well as how to approach any given situation. Furthermore, when it comes to education, negative st stigmas should be removed as it does more harm than good. Instead of pushing students beyond the academic limits or increasing workloads, institutions should have students' mental health interests at heart and not only their academic interests. Effort can be seen as their guidance counselors at school to assist students along with other organizations such as the Student Support Services Division. There are also private organizations and youth groups available across the Caribbean to assist children with their needs. In Jamaica, 
there are over 20 child guidance clinics that provide assistance for children and adolescents. As education continues to revolutionize, continued interest in students' mental health should be a main priority. Thank you. All right, thank you, Maya, for your insights into yet another unseen pandemic, the, the issue of mental health, which is of concern across the region and not only as it relates to education. And we thank you for your perspective as well as a student in, 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 in highlighting both the negatives and the positives as you sought to provide those links between the mental health crisis and the issues of education stemming from the onset of the coronavirus. We would move right along to our next presenter, Adana Stout, who will take us into the dialogue on informal education in this new normal. Hi, pleasant good afternoon to our ladies, gentlemen, students, and guests who have decided to bless us with your presence and attention for this conference. I'd like to say it's a tremendous honor that I am presenting before you today. Now, we are all attentive to the impact the coronavirus has made on the educational sector. However, I believe that the influence COVID-19 has had on informal learning has been overlooked by many. Furthermore, I think that this oversight is due to the reality that we are still clenching onto our tradition of formal education in the Caribbean. Instead of entirely acknowledging the fact that COVID-19 has revolutionized education to be more extensive. Therefore, before we start, we want to know the difference between formal learning, informal learning, and non-formal learning. Thus, informal education is basically learning that happens away from the formal environment of a classroom or educational institution. This can consist of self-study, reading articles, watching videos, and so forth. Thus, informal education carries the great convenience of being able to get done anytime, anywhere, and through more than one mean. Furthermore, we engage in informal learning by doing things like watching and paying attention to the news or cartoons, anything that we learn during that time while in front of our own, while in the comfort of our own homes is a form of participation in informal learning. I recall when I was younger, for example, I adored watching the television series SpongeBob and I learned the proverb, all that glitters is not gold. And I keep this in mind when making daily decisions. Before, for the more adventurous bunch of us, we tend to learn different things while we explore, whether it be about our country, culture, or history. On the contrary, formal education is learning that is distributed in a systematic, intentional way. Hence, the most basic examples of this uh, any form of traditional education stemming from primary school, secondary school, all the way to tertiary education. This form of learning carries the significance of most times providing an environment the learning individual will be able to focus in and tends to, tends to promote more equality among individuals. And last but not least on this speech, non-formal education similar to informal education is not done in a formal educational system. So if you've ever wondered which category trade schools, culinary schools, places like MIC and CCC fell into, it's non-formal education. And this assists an individual in bringing out more of their practical skills and surrounds itself with much more than academic knowledge. Now, Let's just reinforce what we'll be challenging today, just in case those definitions and examples swayed our focus for a bit. Has informal education fallen to its demise as a ramification of COVID-19? On the contrary, it has actually been promoted, though in a much more forced way, and this is a worldwide change but we can exemplify Trinidad and Tobago if we're looking for specifics. 
Since the government was resolute in the closures of all schools and non-essential businesses and services to curb this outrageous increase in active cases, educators and students, not just in the Caribbean, but internationally, were forced to take a more informal approach to education, which meant staying at home for most, being permitted to wear casual attire to online classes instead of uniforms, and the list goes on. COVID-19 has challenged the Caribbean region to be, become more innovative and step away from traditional approaches in order to have the continuation of education and learning for many individuals. For example, one strategy we all know has been implemented is that of online learning platforms. And even though this strategy encourages inequality for an approximation of 20% of students, according to the United Nations, just in Trinidad and Tobago alone, because they lack the necessary equipment and resources to proceed with their education. This was still a means to an end, which pivots typical traditional face-to-face -face learning to a much more informal way of learning. However, like most circumstances, this transition has supposed to be beneficial for some, whereas detrimental for others. Where some of us live in an environment that allows peace and quiet for absolute concentration during class, others go through great troubles to focus because they live in uproarious neighborhoods. I can most definitely relate to this because I know firsthand how humiliating it can be when you're trying to present in front of a class or focus on what your lecturer is saying, but there's mu music booming outside. Worse yet, if when I'm presenting and the kind of music playing is the music as we acknowledge as Zessa music. In addition to this, once again, we have children who are deprived of their educational rights due to disparities in the home. For teachers, the informal learning technique requires more creativity formulating lesson plans because they no longer have the classroom at their advantage. Furthermore, I recall reading in an article entitled Responding to COVID-19 Pandemic in Trinidad and Tobago, Challenges and Opportunities for Teachers' Education, that teachers now have the difficulty of capturing and keeping the students' attention. And well, for back in my day, in order to capture our attention, the students had to throw a piece of chalk or marker at us soon, I guess all the get we. On the other hand, this gives teachers the opportunity to flex out of the box thinking by allowing them to utilize different approaches to learning like PowerPoints, YouTube videos, and audiobooks, and so forth. Some students feel much more secured now that they are not required to partake in face-to-face -face interactions, wear their casual clothes, and even stay in their own rooms. Hence, informal learning has already been established as more than just a new norm, but it's yet another approach that requires rectification and time because it's a subjective approach that consists of many pros and cons. Additionally, it should be noted that informal learning does not just have to be stricken for academic learning. It can also be done as a means of passing free time. This significance, this can significantly assist a lot of us to prosper ourselves as individuals in numerous aspects. However, some of us are oblivious to this because we rather mope around about the fact that the honorable, the honorable prime minister has called a state of emergency. As individuals, we can do different things like learn how to cook, try our hands at arts and craft, do a DIY project, and I could carry on and on about the possibilities. Furthermore, you do not even need technology or Wi-Fi to do a lot of these things. It simply requires you to be like your educators and take more out of the box approaches to things. And by doing this, the likelihood and feeling of one's sanity is on the verge of collapse and minimizes. So it's about time that we become more original in our thinking and more compassionate as well for the promise safety and security of our future. Um, thank you all for listening to me. Please be safe. Remember to be your brother's keeper and have an excellent day.
All right, thank you, Adana, and thank you for providing that critical distinction between formal and non-formal education, which I think is important in really contextualizing the discussion given the realities that we are operating in. I particularly like the links you established between being more innovative in education, um, thinking outside what, of what is the norm or traditional, something I think we can discuss a bit more later. Now we have our third presenter, Mr. Yumir Fletcher, who would now bring a student's perspective on platforms, connectivity, and devices. Welcome, Yumir. Thank you for that warm welcome. Good morning, all. Making the transition from face-to-face -face online to online learning has been a challenge for students, some more than others. The onset of the pandemic was very sudden and has caused widespread closure of educational, educational institutions across the region. This has been done in efforts to protect students, educators, and other stakeholders. UNESCO estimates that over one and a half billion students in 165 countries are currently out of school due to COVID-19, and that in the Caribbean, school closures have impacted, have impacted 7 million learners and over 90,000 teachers across 23 countries. These measures have been taken, um, have forced these institutions to innovate and to pick up the responsibility of making major adjustments to the structure of their syllabuses to students, how they administer exams or if they will be administered, making provisions for online platforms to be used, and monitoring how all these adjustments affect students and lecturers alike. Students, being the group most affected, contend with challenges with online learning, anxiety associated with program completion, and the ever-present threat of a dangerous virus. These challenges include inaccessibility to resources, difficulty navigating online platforms, maintaining focus amidst numerous distractions, and coping with isolation from peers. Firstly, reliance on Wi-Fi and electronic devices such as laptops and tablets have now soared due to the pandemic. Having access to these resources are now like gold, critical in order to attend classes, complete assignments, or to take exams. And those who find themselves without these devices suffer. Those of little means who simply cannot afford to purchase them at this time are at risk of being left behind. Some have had to perform many of their class activities on their smartphones, which can be limiting to an extent. Upon the closure of campuses, Many low-income students have now found themselves between a rock and a hard place, since they relied heavily on campus resources, such as computers, libraries, and even reliable broadband to study or do assignments. Sharp rises in unemployment rates have occurred due to mass closure of businesses across the region. And so, many are left without income during this desperate time. I have had personal experience with feeling frustrated and desperate when my laptop fell and broke last year during the middle of my semester. And this has forced me to clean out my savings and borrow money in order to purchase a new one at a time when I could have easily been out of work at any time due to a potential lockdown. And the fact is that even though I was able to overcome this type of challenge, sadly, many were not. Secondly, Many students now face difficulty in getting accustomed to the online platforms that are now being used. Students now have to learn to use computers to do greater amounts of and more complex work than ever before. Most of us have had to install a conferencing apps such as Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and Google Meets, and familiarize ourselves with the various features that these have, often painstakingly. Having this issue compound an already complicated learning environment can be very frustrating, and it makes it very difficult to perform well, especially for those who have had little to no prior experience with the use of online platforms for educational activities. Students have even had to be patient with their institutions and their lecturers as they themselves went through trial and error, adjusting their teaching methods and tweaking their approaches to be more efficient and effective in an online platform during this pandemic. In my own experience, Having to remember seemingly countless details about how to use apps such as Microsoft Teams for class-related activities, keeping up with the changes that come with app updates, and important emails from lecturers can all be very tedious 
And so I empathize with those who may find it an even bigger challenge than I do. Thirdly, dealing with distractions is currently a major cause for concern among students. As students, avoiding distractions while in class was already a common struggle for us prior to the pandemic. And now it has become an even bigger obstacle to learning and productivity than ever before. Since students now learn from their homes, each student's living situation may differ, but some live in places unsuitable for learning entirely. They may be reluctant to turn on their cameras during class so that no one sees what occurs in their background or to turn on their microphones and participate for fear of what the class might hear. This may impact the marks that they receive for participation. The number of potential sources of distraction has grown exponentially. Since the classroom, a place which was designed to facilitate learning and eliminate distractions, is now closed to students, replaced with a room at home that may be uncomfortable for them. For some, going to class felt like a temporary yet regular escape from their situations at home, where they face various challenges that affect their mental health. It can be tempting to scroll through social media while in class, or it's hard to resist opening a notification and replying to a message when trying to complete an assignment. Some are forced to contend with demanding and often inconsiderate family members, excess noise, emergencies at home, and a host of other things that could easily cause one to lose focus. My personal experience, similar to that of my fellow presenter Adana, is that sometimes there can be nothing more infuriating than having a parent or a sibling barging on you while trying to focus on class. Lastly, students having to continue the, their learning in their respective homes has isolated them from each other. While online platforms do allow for some communication and collaboration to continue, although to an extent, it hasn't fully filled the gap left by the absence of face-to-face -face interaction in a physical classroom. They also limit opportunities for, for student development to occur since students tend to feel disconnected from everyone else in the class while sitting behind a screen. Online platforms so far haven't been able to fully provide that sense of community and camaraderie, which are important parts of the university experience. This has thus had an adverse effect on the motivation and functioning of many students. Now, this pandemic has caught us all unawares, but it doesn't just need to be remembered as a period of hardship. It can be remembered as an experience which we all share, one which has showed us the importance of change and not only change, revolutionizing what we do and how we do it and the danger of complacency, provided that of course we take the opportunity to learn from the situation. In a world post COVID, I would like to see real recognition of the value of distance education and blended learning by mainstream tertiary level institutions. In the wake of the chaos wrought by COVID-19, a new resilient education system should emerge. One where the merits of authentic assignments are preferred over timed examinations, which have long been a dreaded source of anxiety, frustration, and worry for students. One where creativity and think critical thinking are emphasized and truly encouraged from students, rather than simply att attaining and maintaining a high grade. Indeed, this pandemic has turned the education systems on their heads and exposed many weaknesses that previously went unchecked for a long time. Although the integration of technology and online platforms into the classroom was already being carried out gradually, they have quickly become the only means by which students receive their education at an unprecedented rate. And as such, in light of all the hardships that students now experience, they need support in a very large way. So may we all continue to work together to revolutionize education for the better. I thank you. All right, thank you, Yamir. And thank you for a presentation that I'm sure we can all relate to. I just wanted to highlight the, the issue of inequality, which you highlighted has been exacerbated as a result of the pandemic. I'm sure some of the issues you've highlighted, including your personal experiences, are shared by your colleagues. I like the fact that you included the challenges for some educators as well. And you know, we have to deal with that alongside dealing with the challenges of students. 
you highlighted the issue of parents badging in when um and I, I i thought back to the earlier example when my daughter decided she wanted to join the forum these are some of the things that you know it's a classical example it's nice that you highlighted so many points that we are we can all relate to as you said shared experience i'm sure we will discuss the issue of resilience which is important i think sometimes we take that word for granted resilience in education which is critical in advancing our development agendas, particularly for small island developing states. So thank you for that. All right, so we now have given a teacher's perspective on addressing issues of curriculum implementation alongside platforms, connectivity, and devices. We have Mr. Pradeep Mathura. Welcome, Pradeep. Thank you very much, Dr. Brizan and Martin, Roxanne. Um, good day, Chair, Mr. Wendell Long, Head of Economics, Dr. Darren Conrad, Director of Academic Services, Dr. Ronald Brunton, presenters, and you, the viewing and listening audience. I am here to share with you all the views from a teacher's perspective as it relates to connectivity, devices, and curriculum implementation. The COVID-19 pandemic has created the largest disruption of education systems in human history, affecting nearly 1.6 billion learners in more than 200 countries. Closures of schools, institutions, and other learning spaces have impacted more than 94% of the world's student population. Despite the over, overwhelming consequences of this COVID-19 pandemic, this global crisis has also been an extraordinary time for learning. We are definitely learning how adaptable and resilient our education systems, policy makers, teachers, students, and families can be. Two crucial factors have shifted due to the pandemic. First, the pedagogical adaptations, the pedagogical adaptations are proven to be pivotal as the traditional lecturing in-person models do not translate to a remote learning environment. No matter the type of channel used, radio, TV, mobile, the various numbers of um, online platforms, Teachers need to adapt their practices and be creative to keep students engaged as every household has now become a classroom, more often than not without an environment that supports learning. I know my colleagues will agree with me when I say that the new and creative methods are time consuming and would have posed difficulty for us who may not have been that tech savvy. However, we have seen efforts supported by the Ministry of Education that have engaged us in learning to navigate through these challenging times. Moreover, the way in which a curriculum would have been implemented in the past definitely had to be altered to cater for the online teaching, as well as the methods of assessment. We also have experienced challenges with teaching online. And uh, as my fellow presenter, um, he's highlighting some of these challenges, uh, Mr. Fletcher, in terms of um, what students face. So from a teacher's perspective, I mean, some of these uh, challenges we face, I mean, there are numerous reasons why students cannot log into classes, turn on their cameras when asked, um, answer questions during class, um, which continue to pose a problem. However, teachers are definitely cognizant of the problems and concerns faced by students in these turbulent times. Uh, we, we know of connect, internet connectivity issues um, where there are persons who do not have internet connectivity, so they are using the package system where they collect packages at the various schools, which in itself poses a problem because um, now that the, there's a lockdown presently, um, we have situations where parents may not be able to um, have the economic means to travel to school to get some of these um, resources. Uh, more so at some schools, actually the ministry have mandated that schools are not opened um, presently. So uh, getting those resources are also posing problems to students as well as educators because teachers now have to find other ways of reaching these students. Um, we, we are also very much aware of the academically competent learners who are now from economically dis disadvantaged backgrounds are unable to access and afford online learning. Um, personally, I have students of mine who I would have seen excel at school and the face-to-face -face environment, but now they are struggling to keep up. Um, their grades have plummeted, um, their parents are calling, they don't know what's going on. You know, so it's real problems that are being faced by our learners. 
and teachers are very much cognizant. Uh, although we are also faced with the, the excuses that may not be the best, right? Um, but there are still situations that we need to take into consideration. Um, so also, we have the online education poses a risk to exposure to increase screen time. So another issue that we have faced with is that we are limited to screen time um, in terms of how much time we spend with the students, um, which is definitely an issue when it comes to curriculum implementation, which I'll speak to in a, in a little bit. Um, so I'm very happy that Mr. Fletcher raised together with the other presenters, um, some of the concerns from a student, more or less from a student perspective, um, what are some of the challenges that they faced and why cameras are not owned, et cetera. So from a teacher's perspective, yes, we are, we are there and we are um, adamant that you put on your cameras, that you answer questions, but we, we are also very much aware that there are reasons why those things cannot happen. Secondly, the pandemic has recalibrated how teachers divide their time between teaching, engaging with students, administrative tasks, and also managing family life. Definitely, our homes become our workspace. Our personal belongings became resources for our students. And our cell phone numbers, which we kept very dear, which would normally not be given to students, are now our main mode of communication. So our personal space, um, I wouldn't say invaded, but I would say that we, there's a very thin line between our personal space and our workspace. So in addition, teachers as, as well as families are still coming to terms with these challenges as we often tried in the past to separate work from home. When now in this pandemic, our work is at home. You know, so I can speak to, I mean, when I speak, I speak for a lot of persons. When I say that we appreciate the time at home, we appreciate being home with our families. However, many teachers struggle to cope with the demands of virtual teaching preparing physical packages, learning to use the technology effectively, and somewhere in between parenting and making and maintaining, sorry, a healthy family life. In addition to the added pressure of now having friends, family members, even acquaintances being tested positive for COVID and, at, and in extreme circumstances, even death. This has led to multiple stories of mental breakdown and stress faced by both the teacher and students alike. Now, furthermore, curriculum implementation, implementation sorry, could not be done in the manner in which we as teachers were used to. For example, as an, as an economics teacher, teaching graphs on a blackboard and explaining to the students right there is totally different of having to draw um, all these graphs of market structures, oligopoly, uh, perfect competition, using the Zoom whiteboard. It's just not the same. And I know there's and various subjects will have the same concerns. In addition, the instructional time needed for curriculum would have been shortened based on the online. Yet our syllabus needs to be completed in order to write exams for CXC come next month, well, based on what the ministry is mandating. So we, we still have to carry about the curriculum. We still have to teach the syllabus that is given to us in a shortened space of time and with these challenges. So it really have created issues. And I just really would like to point to Yes, we are saying we are using technology to teach, but there are, there are laws that will govern some of these things. For instance, copyright laws. That would have been a, before in the past, we would have um, used someone's PowerPoint, use a document um, before you show a video. But today you, you need to cite, you need to get permission to use some of these resources. And that will also be a hindrance to teachers implementing the curriculum within the online environment. Uh, you would have been aware that textbooks that uh, there was a point in time when um, textbooks were being shared online and um, it they were being cracked down by the, the ministry in terms of uh, illegal use of, of, of material. So these are real concerns that we face as teachers. However, we had to adapt and make the necessary changes, but we are still seeing where the assessment methods being used for these curriculums as high stake exams still remain. And definitely, this is my personal view when I say, I think this requires a level of discussion going forward as a traditional chalk and talk method of teaching accompanied by paper-based testing cannot be used post COVID. As we in Toronto Tobago need to apply these teaching, teaching initiatives that would have proven to be effective during the remote learning phase, 
We need to integrate these and, um, into our regular education system, thereby allowing for a better, innovative, and effective system of learning going forward. We just cannot do things the same going forward. Hence, it will be critical to empower teachers investing in the necessary skills, development, and capacity building to explore the full potential of remote and blending learning. So we are hearing rumors, we are hearing talks about blending learning going forward, that we cannot teach the same, we cannot um, administer the curriculum the same, but these things don't happen in chunks. They must be a process, they must be uh, worked out together. Right, everything must come together. It can be that uh, the examining bodies are doing something, the teachers are doing something, the, the learners are being given something, the ministry. No, it must not be in chunks, but it must be a collaborative effort. And we know that's one of the 21st century skill: collaboration, communication. Right. Um, so we definitely need to work on alternatives to the education system and assessment strategies that are more innovative and current that will benefit our students and the economy as a whole. So therefore, leading from today's team, revolutionizing education in the Caribbean, what do we need to do to revolutionize? So uh, the, pre the presenters before mentioned revolutionizing education, and we are seeing all of the challenges, but the, the challenges shouldn't be seen as concerns, um, as roadblocks, uh, as uh, let's say blocks to not move forward, but they should be stepping stones to move forward. They should be the, the drivers as for change. They should be the, the reasons um, that we are willing to change, that we are willing to change the education system to be one that is more productive. And um, Rox, I mentioned resilient coming out of Fletcher's presentation. The fact is that we need to be more innovative in terms of education. Uh, we cannot teach the same way. Uh, uh, there's memes going around, there's images where you show a classroom, you show technology the way that, that bread is baked in 1920 to the way, the way bread is baked today, right? You see technology have changed all aspects of sectors in the economy. But yet education, if you walk into our classrooms, they are still set up uh, the teacher in front and the students are sitting at desk. And uh, we, we, we listen to, to um, examples of Finland and all these uh, Singapore, these education systems that are doing well around the world, but yet in the Caribbean, we follow that traditional way of teaching where the teacher is in front and the students are there. We speak it though, I, I must say that we speak that, you know, we, do, we are doing things different, we are, we are different, we are not the same teachers of the past, but yet when you look at our classrooms, they are very much the same. So we need to, to think a little more in terms of that, in terms of moving forward. And I hope that the questions and discussions that we have throughout the presentations are going to provide solutions, are going to provide ways that we can move forward to a greater education system within Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean at large. Thank you, everyone, for listening. All right. Thank you, Mr. Matura. And thank you for highlighting some of the subjectivity, um, which is associated to the new reality. You did highlight that you know different students may perform differently in different environments. And I think that's something we as educators can relate to. You may have students that perform well in, in the face-to-face -face classroom setting and some students who are thriving in the online environment. It is also refreshing to get another relatable presentation from the, um, the educator's perspective, one in which you, you, you highlighted that there's hardly this distinction between home and workspaces. That was an important one because most times you would find yourself working, 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 working. There is no distinction there. I'm sure we will have some discussions on the curriculum implementation issues later on as we as we work and we adapt and navigate in this new, in this new normal, um, the need for discussions, as you highlighted, is critical. And I think it's not just the discussions at the policy level. It is definitely important. A more collaborative and inclusive approach, it certainly highlights the need for us to really challenge the status quo in terms of moving forward and making fundamental change. We thank you for that presentation. Our final speaker, Dr. Ronald Brunton, will present us on scaling online education implications for post-pandemic higher education. 
All right. Hi. Good afternoon again, everyone. Um, this um, presentation today um, was really developed to share from, I guess, more of a policy perspective. Um, we've heard some really good presentations from the student perspective, um, the, edu the educator's perspective as well. So I'm hoping to bring another dimension to the discussion today. Um, I'll be speaking briefly about the changing nature of higher education. Some of these changes would have started even before the pandemic. And of course, um, they've been exacerbated by the, the, the pandem pandemic itself and the transition from um, the face-to-face -to, -face to the online environment. Uh, I want to discuss as well as has been mentioned by some of the other panelists thus far, um, you know, a blended learning approach, a framework for higher education in particular. And of course, much of this will apply to other levels of the education system as well. And um, sort of trying my hand a, a little bit on the side of, of, of an economist, uh, looking at issues of uh, economies of scale and how do we uh, look to seek certain savings, uh, benefits and cost benefits related to uh, delivering our programs online and uh, asking some questions about the, the quality of, of education. So, um, you know, I think it is uh, is quite um, important to summarize and state where we are in terms of um, changes to the higher education system and the landscape of higher education. Um, we've seen certainly over the past decade or more a global expansion of enrollment in higher education as um, you know countries around the world recognize the importance of upskilling uh, their populations and preparing for the uh, knowledge economies. Um, however, there has been somewhat of a decline uh, over the past few years within Caribbean countries, mainly due to economic concerns and constraints. Um, we also see that higher education is becoming much more international uh, in terms of this curriculum, but also the influence of international providers uh, within our region. So we have, um, you know, throughout the Caribbean region, and of course, Trinidad and Tobago, many foreign providers uh, who have been offering um, their qualifications online uh, or through uh, partnerships with local institutions. So we have, you know, the uh, University of New, uh, New Brunswick, Sutherland, um, Leicester University, many foreign institutions, City and Guilds, uh, ABE, uh, offering qualifications in partnership with local institutions. Um, we've also seen an expansion in the number of institutions, um, both internationally and, of course, in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, as well as new types of institutions um, that are emerging. Uh, we have private uh, institutions, foreign institutions, again, for-profit um, higher education institutions, as well as consortia, um, those kinds of um, institutions where there's a partnership uh, between several institutions to offer programs. So you may start your degree at one institution and you graduate at another institution. Um, those are, are new uh, models for higher education. And of course, we have new types of qualifications that are emerging in higher education. Uh, the micro-credentials, uh, which would be small, bite-sized types of qualifications that are, uh, are referred to as being stackable now. Uh, professional credentials that offer you certification. So you may have uh, professional qualifications in quality uh, or the PMP qualifications, um, some of the qualifications in the field of IT. Um, we have MOOCs, uh, which are massive open online courses. Uh, micro masters, which would be, uh, again, a sort of a MOOC uh, approach to developing a master's degree. Uh, and of course, new modalities in terms of our delivery of the curriculum. Uh, we have the open distance and online learning, ODOL. Uh, blended learning, mobile learning. Uh, again, presenters um, today spoke about using the smartphone in order to access uh, learning materials, uh, M learning, as it would, uh, workplace learning, uh, internships, and of course, emergency remote teaching, which has been the approach to um, adapting to the uh, pandemic and teaching persons online. Uh, the landscape of higher education. Uh, in terms of uh, the qualitative issues, uh, we see that the, um, the, the changing dynamics in terms of, um, of student demographics are changing uh, very quickly. Uh, we have many more mature students accessing higher education. 
uh, education is higher education is no longer reserved for the elites or the ivory tower approach, but is being um, accessed in a more democratic way to some extent. Um, of course, online and blended learning, uh, the relationship between education and the types of skills that are being developed, uh, attempting to bring it more in line with the needs of the economy, and of course the workplace. The fourth industrial revolution, as I would have referred to earlier, um, the types of jobs that are going to be emerging in this new knowledge economy over the next generation, uh, and to what extent is higher education really providing the right skills, the right competencies, uh, right attitudes uh, for the new uh, workplace of the future. And of course, this would be through an emphasis some institutions are adopting uh, related to the 21st century skills and preparing uh, a workforce that is more collaborative, um, better able to communicate, uh, more IT savvy, those skills um, of tolerance and whatnot that will allow our, our graduates uh, to be able to succeed in a more complex and diverse workplace environment. Um, and of course, as we mentioned before, the for-profit higher education institutions uh, that are, are tuning into education because they see uh, the, the, the profit incentive in terms of a driving force. Um, and of course, higher education over the past uh, two decades or so has really been struggling with um, you know, finding the right financial models to be able to um, afford higher education. And of course, we see GATE um, being reduced every couple of years um, in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and probably within uh, less than a generation, we may see that GATE is something of the past. Uh, how do we as institutions, as well as, as um, students and parents be able to afford the type of higher education uh, that is needed to propel us um, in, in terms of our economic circumstances, but also how does the society uh, afford to train its population uh, for the future. Now, again, emergency remote teaching, as we've indicated uh, several times already today, has really been the, the, the response uh, to the COVID, um, the COVID pandemic. Uh, where thousands of universities around the world have moved um, their courses from face-to-face -to, -face to the online environment within a matter of weeks. There are some, some large-scale universities that saw some 3,000 programs that were being taught, different courses being taught uh, in the face-to-face -face were all digitized and put up online within a matter of, of, of weeks. Uh, dramatic change, unprecedented change, as we've indicated already. Some of the institutions uh, were more prepared than others in the sense that they have already started investing in developing a learning management system or training their staff. Um, some institutions, even UWI, had a parallel uh, system through My Learning and the Moodle platform. Uh, so the transition would have been easier for some institutions. Some institutions, however, resisted the change and we saw that there was a slow adaptation uh, to the online teaching environment. Uh, massive training for faculty uh, was needed during this, this period of transition as faculty had to undergo uh, quite dramatic change in terms of their approach to teaching. Um, some, some teachers still resist um, the, the, the transition. They feel that it's just a lecture that they're delivering, but as indicated earlier, there's a lot more to teaching online uh, than it is to deliver a lecture, even a, a virtual lecture. Uh, so ways of engaging uh, learners in that virtual environment is very different than in the classroom. Uh, students also were expected to adapt to the new normal in, in a very short time frame. And as indicated earlier, the distractions as well, um, as students not all having access to appropriate devices or even a good reliable Wi-Fi signal. And of course, the environmental um, distractions uh, associated with it as well. So emergency remote teaching uh, you know, still seems to be, uh, to a large extent, a replica of the face-to-face -face modality just done in an online environment. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, is that adequate? Uh, so as we move forward, uh, we're really looking at how do we design an appropriate model um, you know, in the post-COVID um, post era. Um, have we been able to really revolutionized the higher education? Uh, are the changes been revolutionary or are we simply 
are, are there many persons simply waiting to return to the new normal? Um, does the traditional one size fits all face to face model of higher education uh, meeting the needs of our students? Um, I, I think a lot of people would, would disagree and would say that traditional face to face tends to lack the flexibility um, that is offered through online learning and even blended learning. Um, we also indicated today, and I think uh, some of us have already spoken to the fact that fully online learning uh, also has its disadvantages in the sense that um, you know, it leaves our learners isolated, feeling as if they're not connected to the learning experience. Uh, we have that separation between students, students not feeling connected to the lecturer, uh, are not feeling really fully engaged in the learning process. Um, we have indicated um, through research and uh, many publications that this combination of in-person and virtual learning uh, tends to maximize the benefits of both modalities. Uh, so what are some of the ways in which uh, we can, in a, a more systematic way, um, you know, plan our curriculum development and delivery, utilizing the benefits of both modalities, both the face-to-face -face as, well as, um, as well as the online learning uh, modalities. So in a sense, we need a new, uh, a new modality, a new uh, model that allows us to move away from the industrial approach um, where we, you know, we're looking at standardization um, to a new, uh, I would say maybe post-industrial, personalized, more, more engaging and student-centered approach uh, where education can be customized um, for every individual. Um, and again, we have to ask the question, how uh, will these changes be economically sustainable and financially viable? Um, the model that, that um, I am really sort of advocating based on the research uh, is really developing an appropriate blended learning framework uh, that has to be adapted to the particular needs of, of any specific institution. So what we adopt for a large university like University of the West Indies St. Augustine may not be appropriate for a smaller institution like UWI Roy Tech. Uh, and so you have to understand your institution, your students, um, the types of um, devices that they have, the types of connectivity, um, their experience with online learning, and as well as your faculty members, uh, whether or not your faculty, if they are sufficiently prepared um, for the delivery of face-to-face of -face and online learning, uh, and whether or not they're able to really um, blend them in an appropriate way. Uh, so the model is based on five main uh, features. Um, the teaching and learning practice in terms of preparing your learners for 21st century skills, um, different ways of, of packaging the educational content through synchronous and asynchronous uh, interactions and experiences, um, developing appropriate content and student resources that are accessible, affordable, reusable. We spoke a little bit about the uh, copyright issues and of course, um, in the field of, of, um, of higher education, we're talking really about open educational resources that are free and available online uh, that can be accessed and, and, and whatnot. Um, the formative and continuous assessment that allows uh, students to understand where their uh, deficiencies may be, where their strengths are. And so we're talking again about real-time performance-based assessment may not necessarily be counting for your marks, but really to give uh, students a sense of where they are in terms of uh, the levels of competence and what are the, the, the areas they need to strengthen. Even the use of artificial intelligence tools uh, to be able to um, really understand and diagnose the learner. Uh, again, professional development of, of uh, our faculty members and of course the, uh, an inclusive framework that is digitally friendly um, to students, uh, providing even devices for all, uh, if, if possible. Um, so, how do we um, how, how do we make online learning um, economically viable? How do we scale uh, online learning in such a way that it is affordable to the institution as well as to students? That's the question that really is the, uh, the core of my conversation today. Um, what what do institutions need to do? to be able to apply the economies of skills uh, that will allow rapid and additional growth in terms of enrollment and student 
participation uh, at a marginal cost to the institution. Um, how, can, how can institutions benefit from and reduce their costs uh, through online learning without sacrificing quality of the learning experience? What, what are some of the obstacles to achieving economies of scale uh, in terms of the cost of developing your learning management system, for instance, the training that is associated with your faculty, providing appropriate devices and, and whatnot to your student population? Um, do larger universities and institutions um, have certain advantages in terms of the, um, the ability to deliver online learning more uh, efficiently? Um, to be able to prepare the content in a professional way that maybe smaller institutions will not be able to afford. And of course, what, what about the playing field? How, how um, equitable is the, um, the playing field between institutions um, to compete in this environment? Um, are foreign institutions, for instance, who may have very large budgets be able to outcompete smaller institutions uh, in terms of the delivery of online institution um, education uh, and how can the potential benefits of online learning be passed on to students in terms of reducing the uh, tuition um, expenses um, of course some questions of quality also emerge uh, in terms of uh, whether or not um, the quality of, of online and blended learning is accepted by employers and by educators um, we also see that not all um, providers and not all types of qualifications are, are seen as being trusted um, by employers. Uh, how has the issue of massification and commercialization of education uh, impact on the legitimacy of higher education itself? Uh, has there been a diluting, uh, watering down of the curriculum and academic standards? Um, and of course, we all know that the uh, whole issue of diploma mills still continue to persist in, in, in higher education. Um, so how do we challenge uh, the existence of these types of institutions? And of course, um, what is the role of accreditation agencies um, like the ECTT, for, for instance, uh, in terms of regulating quality uh, of higher education and developing standards for online and blended learning from a quality perspective? Um, and are these agencies uh, fully equipped uh, in terms of having the expertise to be able to regulate um, uh, and develop appropriate standards to ensure quality across um, different providers and of course different modes and different models of education because of course one institution's conception of blended learning might vary quite significantly from how another institution may package their blended learning content. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's really been quite a pleasure for me to be part of this conversation. I'm looking forward to your, um, your questions and to um, you know, hearing from the perspective of our, our um, other persons joining online. Uh, I'm gonna end it there. And again, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, bye-bye. All right, um, thank you, Dr. Brunton. And I think you've provided some useful insights to our participants, particularly in highlighting the new types of institutions, the new types of in, um, qualifications. I've always said to students, do not equate having a degree to developing skills. It is refreshing to hear you identify the need to incorporate these to allow students to have that advantage of being able to function in a different and a more competitive environment. Being cognizant of the um, changing landscape of higher education is also um, important in navigating and adjusting in this new reality. Um, with respect to the emergency remote teaching, it highlights again the whole dialogue and resilience, which would allow for easier transition in, in, the, in unprecedented times. I certainly think and agree with the point of moving away from that teacher-centered experience to one in which the approach is more um, personalized, engaging, and student-centered. Um, the need for environment and institution-specific modalities is also very critical. I particularly found the use of, um, in, in personal experience, the use of formative and continuous assessment to be an asset in navigating in, in this new way of, of teaching and learning. So thank you for those insights. So we have come to the end of the presentations and we want to thank everyone for their excellent 
presentations. Um, originally, I wanted to engage the, the panelists a little bit, but I see that we have quite a few questions from the, the listening audience. So I think I will go straight into those questions. Now we have one question for all the panelists and this person wanted to know what are the panelists thoughts on universities regionally switching to a hybrid mode of learning post COVID. I think probably we could start with, um, with Maya and probably go in that. Hi. So reading the question over, I saw that he made good examples with the fact that um, money being saved on student rent and whatnot. And I believe that yes, there are a lot of advantages when it comes to shifting the traditional ways of learning. And uh, I think that there has been more pros than cons um, as listed. And I believe that if there is improvements in where there are cons, I think that um, online learning can be the best way to go. Also, there is no telling when the pandemic may end. So the best thing to do is to adjust where the adjustments are needed and work to suit with that. All right, um, we could go on to, to Adana. She there, um, Yamir, you could go ahead. Yes, um, I think similarly to what Maya said, that it has its pros and cons, um, which we should see uh, manifesting themselves as time goes by. Um, but generally, I welcome the change. Um, I, although I think it should have been made sooner, um, I have personal experience with some of the things that were mentioned in the question. And um, so I have benefited in some ways. It should benefit some persons um, and it could benefit everyone differently with their different circumstances. And thus, I think a more hybrid approach would be more resilient. Um, according to what Dr. Brunton said, um, I think that some effort should be um, applied to monitoring the results of implementing such an approach. And I think that standards should be made with regard to um, how, um, how institutions should, should aspire to reach uh, regarding the hybrid method and um, some methods of, of improving it as time goes by. All right, thank you, Yamir. Mr. Matura. Um, I totally agree that the hybrid is, um, is important. Um, it is the way forward. Uh, we, we can't go back, right? Moving forward, we can't go back. So the hybrid is something that is necessary. Uh, blended learning, actually, uh, from my experience at the university, um, doing the MED there, uh, there was a blended approach. Um, so we had lecturers that would do uh, use um, Blackboard Collaborate for some days, and then they will use face-to-face uh, -face for certain days. Um, more so the face-to-face -face was used for that um, interaction, that one-on-one -on -one meeting the lecturer, that kind of thing. Um, but you realize that, uh, and this is from a personal perspective as well, uh, my wife um, teaches physics, and that requires a lot of lab work. And I think that is something that, that needs to be factored in so yes, um, our subjects are very theory, economics, you know, English is very theory, it's very, um, it's, it's, it's easier to be used using a blended approach, you know, because a lot of reading, that kind of thing. But when it comes to the practical subjects, I think that's where the, the blurred line is. Um, how do we allow them, you know, because they don't have labs at home, they don't have the equipment at home. So I think bridging the gap, you know, um, that is where the blended should be, um, should, should be used. But as I said, I, I think it's the, the way forward. Um, it has a lot more pros, I think, um, than cons. Yes, we have to get through the whole uh, mindset, you know, that mindset of having to go to school. Um, we, we are custom in our classroom. You know, the, up to this day, there are still, some of us still feel that, you know, we need to be in a classroom, you know, it's different. But eventually, I think it's going to change. Um, the, once the mindset changes, I think things will get better. Yeah, right. And it, al it also speaks to, you know, being a bit more innovative as well, because um, I, I, I use the example, for example, with agricultural science, it could be something as simple as teaching the children to make their own gardens at home, which is a, a bit more practical. 
as well. Let's hear Dr. Brunton's um, thoughts on this. All right, so I mean, um, I think we've heard a lot of really uh, good ideas from the, the panelists and even looking through the chat, uh, a lot of really good comments. Uh, in terms of the, the, the hybrid or blended approach, I think we need to, to get away from the idea that the emergency approach was, was really the best approach. And moving forward, I think we need to recognize that it must be systematic, that it really requires quite a lot of planning ahead of time. Uh, and that is on the responsibility, not just of the lecturer, um, but the entire university. Uh, in terms of preparing their faculty members with appropriate training to be able to do so, um, to be able to identify which units can be done best face-to-face -face and which units can be done best online. What are some of the simulation software that can be used even for those practical chemistry labs? Um, you know, you have virtual reality that can be used um, for the fields of chemistry or physics and other fields that you can't even engage in most um, schools um, because you are not able to uh, afford a centrifuge or something like that. Um, so there are online tools that are available, but it's really about uh, taking a systematic approach to doing so and having the experts come together to plan the exercise. You can't just leave it up to the individual teacher alone. Uh, it must be a, a planned and systematic approach. Right, I agree. Adana, any thoughts? You're mute. My absolute apologies for that. Yes, I agree with Mr. Brunson on that, that it needs to be taken a systematic approach because I do believe that a hybrid approach to learning would be significant or it would be beneficial to the individuals who can't technically go on campus or who are trying to save money and so forth. But at the same time, we can't neglect the fact that formal learning on the campus can also do the same for other individuals as well. So that's my perspective on it. All right, okay. Thank you guys. Um, Maya, we have a, a question from one of the viewing audience. She said, you spoke about pressures students face to ensure they attend prestigious schools. And I think they're um, speaking more of the context of Trinidad and Tobago and how this affects their mental health. I would like your, your take on how failing to enter these schools affects students and how can we start breaking that stigma against non-prestigious schools? Okay, so thank you for the question. So students are usually forced to rewrite the exam and it results in, be, um, in them being a year behind the age group and are left with the challenge of making new friends and to find a place, no, a new place. And I believe this stigma begins in the home. Parents should know their child's academic capabilities when selecting their, their school choices. Also, parents should be comfortable and proud with their child's performance, especially if they are trying their best. Additionally, reassuring that whatever school they pass for do not determine if they are smart or not, and to remember that success is not based on what school you attend. I think this can boost their confidence and accepting themselves and not putting a grade or mark to their name. I think that is a good start in removing the stigma. All right, thank you. And I really want to get the perspective of the educators on this question as well, because I know it's something that um, plagued, and we are in SEA season right now in Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Brunton and, and, and Pradeep, what are your thoughts on this? Pradeep, you could go ahead. <laughs> oh. Go ahead, Dr. Brunton. He said you could go ahead. Yeah. Right. You know, so uh, in, my, in my introduction, I indicated that. Um, you know, the, the concept of revolution is not just about making things better from a technical perspective. Um, I think that we need to change our mindset about the whole structure of the education system, which I think to a large extent had evolved in Trinidad to serve the few and not the many. Um, and as such, we have this concept of the prestige school um, and that only a few persons should reach the, 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 their potential. 
And so when we talk about revolutionizing uh, education in Trinidad and Tobago, we really have to talk about breaking down some of those barriers that have been put up in the education system that really allows only a small fraction of the population to achieve their potential. Uh, and, and really it's, it, is, it is a systematic thing that we need to change. Um, and we can, we can only do so much at the individual level. Uh, I'm seeing now that we are challenging the system. There's a review of the Concordat. I think we need to, to fund as well as, as um, really promote um, different, um, you know, different types of education, um, the non-formal, the informal, the even uh, technical and vocational education, which has really not achieved the kind of investment and prestige that it is um, really worth. Um, we certainly can't move forward um, as a society unless we have trained technicians to, um, you know, to be involved in, in, in the economy. Um, so it's, it's a change of mindset, it's a change of systems and structures. Um, and, um, you know, we, we really have a long way to go, but, um, you know, I, I, I can't see things are changing in the future. Okay, thank you, Dr. Brunton. Mr. Matura. Uh, I would like to agree with Dr. Brunton when he said mindset. Uh, in the 1980s, um, there was a drive by the Ministry of Education to um, have trade schools be set up, just like, um, well, back then would have been John Donaldson. Um, those institutions were set up for trade um, students to learn trade. Uh, they were going to remove students from the standard private classroom um, who would have failed common entrance, and they would have been sent to these trade schools, quote unquote. Um, what happened? Parents, society questioned, is my child not bright? Is my child not capable? Why is my child being sent to a trade school? Why are they not being sent to an academic school? Why are they not doing math and English? And you know, the mindset of the parents back then, society, not just parents, but society back then, to society today, it's they are still grappling with the fact that if my child doesn't enter into um, a school where they are doing um, eight or nine subjects, academic subjects, then they're not good enough, you know? And it's something that we need to step away from, we need to move away from. And as um, Sir said, Dr. Brunton said, you know, it takes time. It takes time for people to recognize. I think society is now realizing what a trade person would be paid compared to somebody who does academics, right? <laughs> so now you're seeing, you're seeing the salaries comparable. No, and I think that is the, the wake up call because you're hearing a lot of people saying, oh, I want to be an electrician. Even when we ask about form three, so what do we want to do when you're going to form four? You know, you'll still have those who say, well, sir, my mommy said I had to do chem, bio, phys, you know, or econ, POB, um, business. But then you'll hear the few say, you know, sir, I want to do something different. You know, I want to be, I want to be an electrician or a technician, I like computers. And you're seeing the change among the students, but I think it needs to be driven by society as well. And that's a key role, right? So yes, the prestigious, and as I said, the discussion about the Concordat is going on, um, Tutor is being engaged, other stakeholders are being engaged in terms of discussions of removing the Concordat, because they believe that the Concordat have, the Concordat have also placed that umbrella of prestigiousness over it, right? Because most of the board schools are considered prestigious. Very few government schools, right? We have a few that we can count our fingers that we say it's prestigious or gets a, a high caliber, quote unquote, of students. But the thing is that um, it's not just the Concordat, because the Concordat in itself, I mean, if you listen to the discussion, the Concordat in itself, um, it, it stands for something. It doesn't stand for prestigious. It's just that um, over, the, over the years, the schools, the administrations of these schools have actually pushed an academic head. So it's different. So I mean, I'm not saying that the government schools don't, but I'm also saying that there are government schools that do extremely well, that get these scholarships, just like these procedure schools. So I think it's a mindset of society and what we expect from our students, um, from our children, and what we would want for them in the future. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. And I certainly agree with the, the whole issue of mindset and socialization. Um, just last week in our webinar, we were speaking about you know, career days and broadening the scope of career days. And it's not just doctors, lawyers, teachers. You know, show children the possibilities that they, they can have with different career options. So I think that is important. We have a question to you, Mira, and I want to throw out this question to, to our three undergraduates because I think you all will be able to relate to this um, well. Someone wants to know with, you know, with 
the constant loud noises from neighbors, you know, your phones, notifications, all these things. What strategies have you used to avoid distractions um, while learning from home and trying to keep your grades up? And if um, whatever strategies you think you could give advice to our listening audience, Yamir, we'll start with you. Yeah, no problem. Um, I personally have made a uh, use of the do not disturb feature on my phone or um, at times the airplane mode, even when I'm like studying or trying to do an assignment. Um, that helps to really uh, not let a notification that pops up. If for some students who use their phones um, to participate in class, um, when a notification pops up, it diverts your gaze. And if something is being discussed in class that is very important or something that you really have to follow along in, in order to be able to understand and remember, um, it would require you your full attention. So using those features on, on your phone or your laptop or um, even placing um, your phone in another room um, if you're using another device, that would help because if you need to be distracted by it, you would have to physically get up and get it. So that could also help as well if you're trying not to be distracted. All right, thank you, Yomir. Maya, what about you? So my personal experience is that I have birds in my room. So the whistling is distracting. So you won't, when you're in class or in school, before the pandemic, you won't be hearing birds. That's not unusual. So, um, Things like that, my coping mechanism, they, the birds are usually removed. And with regards to what you mirror saying with the phone, I totally agree. I do the same. However, I'm in a different room, but it's a good distance away from me. So I really have to think about getting up to go for it. And sometimes when you're in class, I don't think that you're not really thinking of getting up or removing yourself just to go and get your phone. And also, you can have WhatsApp and all these apps open up on your computer. So I think it's more of a mental mindset you have to put on that when I'm in class, I'm not going to put it on because now I don't need my phone. I could easily access it on the computer. I could message back people while I'm in class. So you need to, I think it comes with strength and motivation and what you can tell yourself that at the end of the day, you have to, look, you have to do some self-introspection. Where do I fall weak? what who who messaged me that I just have to message back or all these things. So these are factors that come into consideration. All right. Thank you for that. What about you, Adana? For me, I fully relate to Maya and you may on the do not disturb feature for my phone. I also avoid doing work on my bed because that's when the laziness tends to creep in. So I go by my desk and I stay up late at night and I do work there for hours on end. Not to mention, I think you really need to have a mindset that doesn't just have motivation, but is entrenched in discipline as well. Because when times come that you are tempted to listen to the music that they're playing outside, you really need to realize that I want this degree or I want this, I have an objective. So I want this for myself. So I need to lock any other distraction out and basically focus. Right, I certainly agree with you on the idea of discipline because even in academic advising and, and mentorship that we do in the Department of Economics, we try to reinforce the, the, the need for timetabling, for sticking, sticking to study schedules and these things. You have to maintain a level of discipline because um, I mean, for, for persons in tertiary level institution, you have no teacher behind you saying, do this, do that. So it's a lot on you to develop that discipline and stick to what you have um, you have signed up for. Um, Pradeep, we have a question and we have a lot of questions for you, um, Pradeep, on, on this year. Um, someone wants to know what advice would you give to teachers having to um, navigate online platforms, whether it's to keep students engaged or to effectively execute the curriculum with all the challenges that present itself. And I think I would direct that to both you and Dr. Brunton, having that experience in dealing with, with, with that. Pradeep? Hi. 
Um, so definitely, um, we need to remember that um, it's the new normal, right? Um, just um, the beginning of this term, I had to tell my students, I said, um, we have to stop complaining and coming up with the reasons why um, we are in what we're in, right? And uh, I think that's the first thing. We need to accept that it's the new normal. Um, it's a new way that we need to move forward. Um, once we, we start accepting that, then we start accepting the responsibilities of moving forward with the, with the intentions of um, having our students do the best, right? Um, but what I think helps the most during this time is really uh, for new teachers um, is learning to adapt to the new system, um, communication and collaboration. Communication and collaboration is very important. Um, staying in connect, um, staying in connection with with peers, right? So um, forming groups. Uh, you can do it in your in your district, so your northeastern district or the St. George district. Find groups of teachers who share the same subject. You know, um, maybe it's if it's primary school standard five teachers come together, and what you can do is share resources amongst yourself. Because I think that's one of the biggest things. Because in this online environment, you have to create your own resources. And I spoke about the copyright laws and so, so it's very tedious to have to create lesson, uh, lessons, PowerPoint slides to get videos. It's time consuming, it's, um, it's a lot. So you need to pace yourself. And once you collaborate, as I said, with your, with your peers, people will share resources. Once you are willing to share, it's gonna happen, right? So you could create those teams. Um, I know that we have like a POB, we have a business thing going on for, for teachers um amongst ourselves so you know you create that 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 is one way of getting resources sharing resources right um also uh you can engage as well like your hod's um i know that the ministry of education has a lot of platforms now um well, I shouldn't say a lot of platforms they have a platform the learning the learning system platform right where you can get resources for your specific subjects right um so i think that is the biggest thing um being online uh, getting resources to, to help you. And then too, you need to also face the challenges of no cameras and uh, students not answering questions and these things. So you also have to get ways to engage them. So I would say uh, there is a, a difference between the chalk and talk um, lessons compared to the, the ones that require the students to do things. So what you could have is like, you know, like treasure hunts, have them do things within the, the home that will get them a hands-on experience to the topic that you're teaching. You know, so we may have to become creative, very creative as teachers. Um, how can we get that content to them at the household level, at the home level? What can they do at home that can have them appreciate the content that we are doing? And um, so once they're economists, teachers of economics around, you know that, you know, you need to be real. So I have them listen to, to Mr. Colin Bird talk, you know, when he's doing, talking about taxes, the only government talking about recession, I have them listen to, you know, some of those speeches, things like that. So I, I think that's some help moving forward. Thank right. you. Nice, Dr. Brunton. Right, so I, I just want to build off of what Pranipa has just indicated and also to mention that, you know, the, the higher you go in the education system, the less trained the teachers are to actually teach. So, I mean, my, my uh, experience is really at the tertiary level and, you know, there's a lot that teachers in higher education can learn from teachers at the other levels of the education system who um, are really quite innovative and quite creative. Um, and I, I think in higher education, um, professors also need to, you know, recognize that it's not just about being the guru or being the expert alone. Uh, it's really playing a different role in the classroom. Um, it's really playing a role as a facilitator of learning. Um, and so in higher education, we're really moving away from just the lecturer standing up in front of the classroom, be it a, an actual physical classroom or a virtual classroom, and, and giving a lecture for 45 minutes, an hour, two hours, or whatever, and really engaging the learner in a more authentic way, as uh, Pradeep has indicated there. Um, getting the students involved in activities, uh, exploring their interests, um, finding resources online, uh, engaging with each other, uh, working in groups, learning from each other. Um, and, and that is the way I think education needs to be driven in terms of um, real change in, in higher education. Um, really, it's a much more collaborative approach that needs to be taken. 
um, you know, the networks that Pradeep is talking about to facilitate the teacher, um, you know, and ensure that it's not any one like uh, teacher is overwhelmed uh, with finding resources, but the sharing of that resources, developing networks, uh, critical. And so, you know, I, I see that the benefits of this new environment will spill over uh, even after the, co the COVID period, um, and that we should not expect things to be the same. And um, we should really resist, I think, what will be a temptation by some to return to how things were done before. So I would rather get that. Yeah. And linked to, to, to what you all both um, highlighted, I just somebody in the, in the chat asked, you know, in the same vein that students may be suffering from mental um, health issues and anxiety, what strategies can be used to help teachers? Because um, from what you're saying, you realize that there are a lot of pressure is on teachers to adapt and, and change curriculum. What strategies can be used to help teachers in this process? Um, Pradeep? Okay. Um, well, definitely, I would say that um, in terms of the, the student-teacher relationship, we need to set boundaries. Um, I think boundaries is important, um, even if we have WhatsApp chats, because we may have WhatsApp chats with our students, we may want to reach out there to them because we know that, you know, that's a main mode of communication, but we need to set boundaries. Um, you don't expect to get a message 10 o'clock in the night or a parent messaging, messaging you at 11, expecting a response, you know, things like that. So we need to set boundaries. Um, you know, you can say things within the, the school time between eight to two, you know, things like that. So we need to set boundaries, what is accepted, what is not accepted. Right. Um, we also need to avoid toxicity. We need to avoid um, the negatives because we are going to get negatives. You're going to have parents saying things. You're going to have society, as I said before. You know, a lot of things are going to come at you, but you need to eliminate that. You need to think positively and you have to remember your goal. And I think most of us, I mean, not most, all of us, our goal is to have the students to the best. Right? We want the best for our students. Um, despite the circumstances they may face, we want them to do the best that they can do, right? Um, I also say that we need to develop healthy plans, right? In terms of our meals, uh, when we eat, you know, we, it shouldn't be that okay, we rush into class to, to log in and you didn't eat properly, you know, things like that. And these are simple things that, you know, um, Roxanne, I mentioned after, she always posts these, these status where she show you how to, to, to motivate yourself, right? Before you can motivate someone else, you need to be healthy. You need to, to be the best that you can be before you can actually help others to move forward, right? Um, also, uh, I believe it was Yamir that mentioned, you know, you set schedules. Um, I think Maya mentioned as well that you set schedules and that you have uh, a plan for the day. So you, you know that you don't use your cell phone in the classroom. You don't um, call your friends while class going on. You know, so you practice some of those simple things that you would have done that you could not have done in the classroom. If you practice those things, um, being in the online environment for that hour, that 45 minutes, whatever time you are teaching, I think it helps. It helps. So, you know, it's not that you want to do the same that you were doing in school, but is that you, it helps you to keep that frame of mind. And in terms of the mental issues, I just wanted to mention that there is um, something by the Ministry of Education for teachers, right? Um, it's called the, give me one second, right? Um, it's actually called the Employee Assistance Program, right? And I asked Roxanne to put a number up for teachers who are listening on, who may want to Call, um, I think it's free session. Actually, it's free sessions. I think it's 12 free sessions that they help to um, mentor, to talk to you all. Um, uh, you can trash out your issues and so with them because this mental issue is a real, real, real phenomenon going on around households now. I mean, uh, we hear it as a teacher, we hear it as a family member. It's real. And I think that we, we need to remove that taboo that, you know, like that somebody, you know, they, they, they don't know how to deal with things. That's why they get on like that. You know, we have things like that. And we, we believe that, you know, we should shun away from it. But we need to accept it and we need to really help the person, help each other to move forward. Thanks. Right. So before, we, before I ask everyone to just give a few closing remarks, we have a question to Dr. Brunton, which I think is important. Um, and I think the undergrads as well here, would appreciate something from your perspective. Um, the, the audience member said you spoke about, about there being changes in higher education. 
we have been seeing more and more a uh, co-modification of education where tuition is higher, yet the job market does not have a need for about 50% of our degrees offered. How do you see the demand for higher education changing or rather adapting to cater to the needs of the economy? Most students aim for engineering, law, medicine, but there are no jobs there. In what areas do you see there be the greatest need mm -hmm. for the human resource in Trinidad and Tobago's changing economic landscape? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that, that's an excellent question. It really um, asks the questions, how, how relevant is a degree um, nowadays? And, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's quite a, a, you know, sort of a, a paradox that we've arrived ourselves at, where we've promoted law, medicine, engineering as these kind of prestigious uh, qualifications that we all, well, many people aspire to. But the reality is that the economy can only absorb so many persons, uh, you know, with these types of qualifications. Uh, so I, I think really a lot of people are now recognizing that um, it's a combination of things. One, um, you know, there's a lot of um, a, a lot of room for more specialized qualifications that are professionally oriented. Um, so, for example, project management and getting your PMP certification. Uh, quality is another area. Health and safety. Uh, so we're talking about, um, in addition to having a first degree, uh, pursuing professional type qualifications that are very specifically designed to meet a need within the workplace. Uh, secondly, I, I think um, we're also looking at when we design our degree programs to include the types of soft skills that are needed in the workplace. Uh, so, you know, you spoke about resilience. We, we also need to have uh, business etiquette, teamwork, collaboration, the types of transferable skills that you learn. Um, it, it may appear to be um, you know, sort of by the way, but if it is designed into your curriculum, you have your students really being able to, to practice these types of um, skills as part of the assignments, part of the assessment um, in creative and new uh, ways in which the curriculum is delivered, but also what you expect from students in their delivery of, of the assessments. Um, so it's about those soft skills as well. Um, and, and I think also, um, you know, individual persons need to, at, at the individual level, get to understand what their desires are in terms of what their interests are. You know, so your, you know, your parents may be pushing you to do a degree in medicine, um, but you actually have an interest in law or you have an interest, um, you know, in, in, in another field. So how do you, um, you know, develop that sense of self introspection and reflection? to be able to understand what your talents are and how can you uh, use those talents uh, to propel yourself forward into the right field. Maybe you have an interest in, in, in graphic design. Um, uh, you know, a graphic artist can charge anywhere from $750 an hour and up, <laughs> you know? So how do you really research as an individual what your interests are, get to know yourself better and see how you can apply that to your own professional development, uh, even though it may not be um, mainstream and even though it may not be what was expected of you initially. Right, thank you for that, Dr. Brunton. I just yesterday, I was having a conversation with two students and I was using the example. I said, if you both graduate out of UE with first class honors and you go for a job, how do you get decide who is getting picked? That's why you need to think about how do you separate yourself from the pack? What kind of exit profile do you want to make yourself marketable? And what you would find is that an employer will start looking at these soft skills, your ability to work as a team, your, your planning skills, these kinds of things. So I always encourage students to not just focus while the academics is important, you want to get involved in things that will also highlight those skills that you have. Um, you know, stop seeing your, 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 your little skills, as they like to say, as hobbies and start seeing it as potential careers. And these are things that I think is important and students need to, when you start a university degree, start thinking as early as possible, what is the exit profile I want? What do I want to leave here with outside of the degree that will make me marketable? 
So I think that is an important point and something that you know the students could take away from this. As we close off, I would just ask everyone if you want to just you know highlight one takeaway that you would want to give to our viewing audience before we hand over to the chair of the session. Adana, was it Maya first? Maya first, yes. Hi. So one takeaway I from this entire um, conference is that I appreciated um, everyone's perspective, especially when the questions were asked, because now for students, teachers, parents listening, they got a holistic view as to how to approach situations. And I think that could be appreciated. And that is the takeaway um, I value the most, that there was something beneficial for everyone listening. Thank you, Maya. Adana? I agree with Maya and another takeaway that I would like to highlight from this conference was the emphasis on mental health and coping mechanisms. I think that we really need to take these things into consideration given the times that we're in because you don't want to be brought to your demise during COVID-19. You still have a future, you still have goals, you still have things to go towards and you should use this time to basically be prosperous in something, one thing or another, and help yourself and your family and be your brother's keeper during this time. All right, thank you, Adana. Amir? Yes, um, I would just like to highlight the fact that, you know, um, all stakeholders uh, being affected, um, you could argue equally by the pandemic and the resulting um, consequences from it. And so this is really a time moving forward and evaluating what approaches we can take and um, listening to the viewpoints of everyone involved. We must also realize that collaboration is needed. We mustn't, as students, to um, look at the lecturers or, or, or institutions which we learn from as the enemy. Uh, you know, we must really put everything in perspective. It's a situation that is affecting all of us. And so lecturers um, are having their own unique uh, challenges that they face. Um, the institutions themselves, they have put a lot of resources and a lot of trial and error went into um, developing these uh, methods of learning, which we now benefit from. And even though they're not perfect, as Dr. Button stated, they, are, they resulted out of an emergency. And so as time goes forward, we will be working on them and evaluating their, uh, their merits. And so we should really uh, look forward now to working together in order to revolutionize education post school. Thank you, Yamir. Pretty. I'd like to um, thank Holy Panels for their, their perspectives. I think it really brings a light to different views and um, what teachers may see um, and what students feel and what students experience is, is different. And um, I think it really was able to bring to light some of those, those challenges. Um, also, I'd, I'd like to leave a quote actually with everyone. And it says, um, whoever teaches learns in the act of teaching and whoever learns teaches in the act of learning by an author, Paolo Freire, in his famous book, Pedagogy of Freedom. And basically what he's saying is that there is no teaching without learning. And in this time, this, this COVID pandemic is teaching us how to move forward and it's teaching us that change happens. Change is the only constant, right? Ceteris paribus, right? So just note that it's moving forward and understanding what we're going through now, how we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Pradeep, a true Iban teacher at heart, Ceteris <laughs> Paribus. Dr. Brunton. <laughs> right. Uh, Pradeep, I'm really happy you mentioned Paolo Freire, uh, who was a very revolutionary thinker uh, when it comes to education. And uh, that, that really speaks as well to what Adana was speaking about earlier, which is the importance of, of non-formal and informal education and how important it is uh, first to recognize that learning does not only occur within a formal classroom, or even within a virtual classroom. Um, even those soft skills development, which we spoke about earlier, are, are things that we can practice in our everyday lives. Um, the kind of planning that we need, the scheduling, 
um, you know, the confidence that we, we, we develop through uh, mastering uh, many different types of skills in different environments, be it uh, in, the, in, in the technical and vocational areas, even if it is in cooking uh, or in the arts. Um, you know, learning should not just be bound to the classroom and learning should not just be limited to getting a degree or a qualification. It's really about achieving our potential and being the best person that we can be. Uh, and I think when you, 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 you really inspire your students and yourself um, to desire learning uh, is what really, uh, it's, it, it's really all about. Um, so that, that's, that's what I would like to leave in terms of, you know, any final kind of comments. And I think that there's so much human potential uh, that can be achieved. And once we reach inside of ourselves uh, and, and, and really see what we are able to do and what we are worth, uh, we're really able to, to do quite a lot. All right. Thank you, Dr. Brunton, for this. And thank you to all our panelists for your presentations. Thank you to our viewing audience for your contributions to discussion. I thoroughly enjoyed moderating this session. And now I would just like to hand over to our chair to end the ceremony here, um, Wendell. Thank you, Roxanne. Yes, um, great job and yet another successful uh, conference. I mean, you and Joel, known as the dynamic duo in the Econ Youth uh, Code Department, in the Econ Department. So it is my pleasure to advance uh, gratitude on behalf of Code Youth and UE Roytech. So first of all, thank you, Ms. Augustus, Dr. Brunton, and Dr. Conrad for allowing each institution to host this joint event, um, conference. Thank you, panelists, for your time and contributions. Ms. Maya Joseph for presenting on critical links between mental health and education. Ms. Adana Stout for presenting on informal education in the new normal. Mr. Yumu Fletcher, champion debater from Yuri Roytech for presenting on platform connectivity and devices, a student's perspective. Mr. Pradeep Mathura for presenting on curriculum implementation along with connectivity and devices from a teacher's perspective. Dr. Ronald Brunton for presenting on scaling online education implications for post-pandemic higher education. And last but definitely not least, members of the audience, Thanks for your many questions. Of course, because of limitations of time, we cannot address them all. And most and foremost, be safe. And thanks again. See you all soon. Take care. Bye.